hey, how's it going? I'm Jason Carter. Welcome to Jason Unleashed. Thank you for watching. Glad to announce that we will have Erica Cobb from Daily Blast Live in the chat in just a few. Uh, she's incredible. She's part of a show called Daily Blast Live that's out of Denver that goes live for 10 hours a day across the country, millions of households every day, and they bring the latest in headlines, pop culture, trending news, lifestyle, you name it, they talk about it. There's eight hosts on the show, and each and every single one of them is just simply incredible. And Erica Cobb is one of my faves on the show. So she's going to be sending a request in just a few. Thank you guys for watching. And if you missed all the interviews here on my IG Live, my IG TV, you can get them over on YouTube, on my YouTube channel as well. So she's going to send a request. We're going to get this going. We're going to get this going because technology has been, been playing us all day. But you know what? It's all good. Let's see. View. And now we have Erica Cobb, guys. Jason Unleash. Erica! Hi! Hello! We made it happen! Oh my god! I have used every single thing in order to make this happen. I have used my laptop, an iPad, a desktop, now I'm on my <laughs> phone. <laughs> what in the heck is happening? You know, we are black. We are resilient. Resiliency, I we say. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. How good are to, you? I'm good. Good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, yeah, see, you're I, um, I see you're coming to me from the she shed. Yes. I was all posted up like, all right, let's get this thing going. And then it was like, <laughs> but you know that's what? just how it is sometimes. Corona. Hashtag <laughs> Corona. Blame everything on the Rona. Blame everything on the Rona. <laughs> For sure. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, you, you guys, D Daily Bus Live, have been really holding it down with the reporting and coming to the fans and the viewers every single day. It's been incredible how you guys have pivoted and have been able to still give a great, informative show every single day. How, how are you doing with this, like what I say, this new normal? I mean, hey, you got to roll with the punches. Like, you know, the key to survival is adaptation. Um, we have a really amazing team. Most of our team is working from home. Um, Tori Shulman, shout out to her. She definitely is holding down the fort. She's there like four days a week by herself. Jeff uh, Schroeder is still going in. And then the rest of us are pretty much from home. And we're just making it work. I mean, it was like a fast turnaround for everyone. Well, how are you doing? I'm great. I just finished yoga. I have my uh, spiritual warrior. Let me, uh, I'm, I'm adjusting as we speak. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, stay mentally healthy. I think that's so important right now. So I've been doing uh, kundalini yoga, which is pretty awesome. Um, just the idea of like balance and being able to stay like not only getting to a certain place, but also being able to stay there. So, um, yeah, I'm just really concentrating on that. And then because I like, I have my studio at home, I've just been working like crazy. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about some of the things you're working on, but I am celebrating women in media this week. And I wanted to celebrate you because you have this extraordinary story of just going, going from radio, Chicago, coming back to Denver, and, this, and, and arriving at a national talk show that's going into, what, its fourth season in the fall, will be the four, fourth year of Daily Boss yeah. Live. I mean, that's incredible. That's incredible. Let's talk about your journey because you're, you know, you're someone who is all about the comeback. Mm -hmm. But to come back, you have to have left something to come back to, right? So let's talk about your journey from where you started as, as, as someone in media to now. Let's take it back, the beginning. Oh, Erica Cobb, as a host. <laughs> well, uh, my background is in morning radio. That's why my studio, like, you, I'm not using this. Obviously, I'm on my phone. Uh, but my background <laughs> is in morning radio. I started in Chicago 20 years ago as an intern at KISS FM in Chicago, uh, W-K-S-C-S-F-M-G. Um, <laughs> anywho. Uh, so, yeah, I was an intern who, like, never left. It's kind of like, you know, you end up getting married because you went on a first date and you never broke up. Uh, but really, I had known forever that I was going to be a radio girl. 
know since I was 12 years old. And so it was a natural transition to do that and, and be an intern. So I was really just like running around, like getting coffee, cigarettes at the time, like whatever anybody needed um, and answering phones. And then um, I ended up being a, like basically a sidekick on the night show. And that lasted for about a year. And I was still in college at the time. I was attending DePaul University and I would just like go back and forth from school. And then about three to four years later, I ended up landing the morning show across the street at the Heritage Station, B96, which was WBBM FM, uh, with two guys who had been in radio forever, Eddie and Jobo. They were Chicago icons and radio. And I got to be a part of that show and they renamed it or rebranded it Eddie, Jobo, and Erica, which was like crazy because I was like 25 years old. So um, yeah, I'm like living, you know, the life and doing the radio thing. And I ended up staying there for three years. I landed a job in Denver right away. So I moved here shortly after I, I, my contract was renewed there. And then I was in Denver for three years. And then things started getting like a little crazy. Like, I was let go from a job. I didn't anticipate it. Like, you know, there are certain things, and I know a lot of people right now are feeling this, you know, you are unemployed or between gigs, but there may not necessarily be a reason that is in your mind, like, oh, that makes sense. And that's yeah. a hard transition to make as to why am I not employed when at all the other, you know, everything pointed in the direction of, you know, I should be there type thing. Right. And sometimes things don't make sense and they're not going to be logical. Um, that's something that I've learned to understand and live with. Um, but at the time, I was just trying to make ends meet. So I was working for the NBA, doing in arena hostessing. I was um, I was doing all sorts of things. Y'all, I was like selling T-shirts. I had a hair extension company for a while. That hustle? <laughs> I was like, the hustle was so real. But then, uh, you know, my personal life fell apart, my financial life fell apart, and I ended up where I was divorced, unemployed, and bankrupt. And I was like, screw everything. Like, just to be really honest about it, that's how I felt. And, uh, you know, things kind of like went downhill really fast, and I was in a really, really dark place. And one day I remember waking up and just thinking like, you know, this isn't fair. And I just kept saying, it's not fair. And then I kept hearing my dad say, like, life isn't fair, Erica. Like, life isn't fair. And then I was like, well, you know, I did everything according to the rules, what I was told was going to work. Now I have to make my own rules, and that's what's going to work for me. So I was just like, if everything has to fall by the wayside and I have to start over, then that's what the hell is going to have to happen. That's what I did and I started deciding what I wanted to do with my life. And what I wanted to do with my life is figure out this TV thing and see if that was a place for me. Which is cool because you, I mean, throughout all of that, when you were unemployed, divorced and bankrupt, that, you know, we hear stories all the time about people who hit rock bottom. And, and you know, rock bottom sounds so cliche and sounds so like what you would hear, you know, and in, 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 I don't know, like, a, a movie about someone who was like a f baseball player and became an alcohol, all the, you know, that, that, and then they come back and, re and have this resurgence. But when you're at your lowest point, which, which it seems as you were, that's, that was actually the gift, right? That right. was the universe or whoever you believe in saying, okay, now I can work with you. Right. Have, you know what I mean? That, and then, and so it put, it's because also, I mean, I don't think I've ever, there has, Erica, I, I, there has been times in my life where I have felt like I've been, where it's not fair. Why are all these things happening? You know, when I first moved here to LA back in the early 2000s, repossessed cars, so many things, you know, and you're just thinking like, why, what, you know, what boat did I miss to have all this happen to me? And you're angry. And you are saying life isn't fair because you thought you did everything right. You right. worked hard, you showed up. You, but they, but looking back, of course, you realize, oh, I, you know, I, I could have paid my car note instead of buying those shoes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. But but it was in those times where, again, whoever you believe in was saying, all right, now I can now let class begin. 
Now Sorry. let's let's start on this journey. So okay, so you came to Denver. You were you had nine jobs. You were you were, the, the hustle was strong, yeah. and you wanted to try television. So from there, you ended up on television. Well, so I was actually in Denver when everything fell apart. Then I decided that I was going to move to Sacramento, where I took a more radio job. And I love morning radio, but I felt like I just kept in the cycle of the same thing, getting the same outcome. And I'm like, I don't understand. And I, I, then I started thinking, well, maybe there's something else for me. And I would love to do radio again. I would love to add radio to my portfolio. But I needed something different after like, I mean, at that point that had been over 15 years. So I moved back to Denver. I had met my boyfriend who proposed to me when I was in Sacramento. He was still living in Denver. I moved back to Denver and I'm like, I'm in a hustle. And that's when I went out to LA. I started um, meeting up with people like our mutual guy, Jonathan, um, who had auditioned me years before for MTV. And, you know, he really kind of helped shepherd me through this process of helping me, like, think about myself as a brand, like, thinking about things in terms of what I have to do in order to get to where I want to go. And that's when, um, you know, Comeback started, and I just really started focusing on the work of getting out content. Like, so many people want to do these things in terms of like being creative but i think the most important gift you can give to yourself is creating your content and being consistent with your messaging and being consistent with putting your stuff out there it's not so much about um you know the perfect video or you know the perfect podcast it's about the idea that this is something that you're giving to yourself, just like you've always tried to build somebody else's dream. Like this is your opportunity to build your own dream. So I did that for a year and legit the 50th video, which was the one year mark, I started DBS. So, so you created this brand, Erica, the, the comeback with Erica Cobb. And one of the things that is so cool about that, Erica, is that everyone loves a comeback, right? And and it's that sort of thing resonates with with just you don't have to be you don't have to be rich, you don't have to be white, you don't have to be black, you don't have to be a man or woman. You everyone everyone has a struggle that they've had to overcome or something that was a setback that allowed them to grow and learn. And it's in those times that it sucks the most. I think it takes the most to be like, yo, this shit sucks. Where I'm at right now sucks. What, what I'm going through sucks. And, and take the first steps to move forward through that. Because you have ego. You're stubborn. You're angry. You're upset. You have, you're all these things that, that weigh on you. And as a human, it's hard to move through some of those emotions. Like being frustrated, ugh, I hate being frustrated. Well, yeah. I would rather be angry because getting over anger is easier to, easier to me than not, than not being frustrated. And frustration is one of the most... I would say debilitating feelings you feel in those times. So the comeback with Erica Cobb is celebrating, hey, your comeback is your comeback is always greater than your setback. And I mean the response you've gotten from people has been just phenomenal. Well, it's a gift. Um, it really is a gift. I just feel like one, there's a quote that I think of all the time, like, you don't tolerate what you hate. Um, and sometimes we have to be pushed into intolerance because we aren't going to make those moves. Like we get comfortable even when things aren't comfortable because maybe everything around us being familiar makes us comfortable. But in reality, that comfort is also hindering us from growth. I mean, why would we change something because it's like the devil that we know versus the devil that we don't know true yeah you have become this i would say role, role model but it's more than that you have become someone who women had women and women of color look forward to seeing daily on daily blast live this show is in what 49 markets yeah, we're in what, 51% of the country now? For eight hours a day, live. You guys, you guys report 
breaking news. You guys report on everything that's trending. And you guys, like I said earlier, have been doing a great job of handling everything that's going on with COVID-19. You had a moment last year, Erica, where, well, hold on, before we get to that, let's talk about how we met, though, because, <laughs> um, because um, we both auditioned for the show back in 2017. And when you walked into the room, everyone was like, who is that? Because you had th these long flowing braids and this smile and this energy that was just so undeniable. Even I, I, I want to stand and tell people like, listen, all you guys have packed your bags. She's oh, looking the job. Sorry. Hey, you over there. It's been nice. Thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> but you had this energy and this, this confidence that felt good in a room that didn't, that felt like people that were really nervous because this thousands and thousands of people uh, sort of were submitted for Daily Blast Live. It was, it was going to be the, something new, something that had never been done before in television, which it still is. And the people that were in the room were narrowed down from thousands. So you have a hundred people that are, that are there in one day that are going for this one job. And you walk in and it was just like this new energy entered. Tell us, about, tell, tell the audience how you came to get Daily Blast Live because I know, and I still get chills, but they don't. So, well, first of all, thank you. But I do have to tell people ignorance is bliss. Here I am flying in from Denver. Everybody else is like LA seasoned professionals. You know, y'all know what's going on. I had no idea what was going on. I was just like, I came here to get my job and go back to Denver. Like, that's all I thought about. I didn't think about who, like, who was who. I didn't understand how, like, producers and all this stuff. Like, I didn't know. Ignorance was my probably biggest gift but when dbl was first announced it was like it was a, a mass call like you saw the audition announcement everywhere and i remember seeing the audition announcement on a website and i went to my husband and i said oh my gosh uh, my color purple was just posted i'm gonna go and get this job and he's like okay and i'm like well i applied and he goes okay well do you just go i'm like i don't know so i'm like well this is the date of the audition it's somewhere in la so i just booked a ticket booked my hotel room and and was like okay i'm just gonna wait to see if they let me in then it was like a couple days before and i still hadn't heard anything and i was like oh no they must not have gotten the memo that this is my job so i'm like calling around like what's going on and finally they invite me and i go to the audition and then once i got to la i was just like okay i'm gonna you know i know show prep i know live shows my background's in morning radio the only difference is people can see me so like this is my job and so i just approached it like it's my job nobody was going to tell me that i was going to come back to denver when the show was produced in denver without this job no you weren't going to be that girl. You going to tell me that. <laughs> no. Yeah. It just wasn't going to happen. I knew it. It was my color purple. I, the color purple. So people, I, I always reference that, reference that from Oprah, from when she talks about manifesting the color purple and how she did that. And how you, no matter how many times you, you hear that story and, or see that video from Oprah, it, it always seems, it always hits you. Like it's their first time and it makes you such a believer in manifestation. And a lot of people talk about manifestation as if it's some trendy thing. Like it's the new, the new uh, mental, the new mental, uh, I guess, mental way of thinking, the new, the new trend of how to live your life. But really, if you think about everything you've ever wanted in your life, you manifested. Like every car I wanted, I manifested. Every, there's been a lot of situations where I, where I thought like, I, yeah, I absolutely manifested this for sure. So to hear you say that, it's true. And your energy that day, Erica, was on point because you came in as if, and not, not in a way that was a super thirsty LA jaded kind of sense of like wanting a job. Because we know what that looks like. <laughs> my shade moment. Look, I'm going to put my shade hat on right now, okay? Because we're, we're, we're just going to go there. But, oh my gosh. I know. But you, you it, it seems just so organic. You know, like, you, you, you have to try hard. So, okay, you come to the audition. I'm there eating eating the craft service with you, eating the great catering they had that day. They had and then great what? catering. Great catering. And then what happened? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I walked in. I met you. You were like, here's the thing. We walk in. We are like, 
we were early like if we were on time <laughs> we were late right. which was great because what that did it gave me a little bit more confidence about the situation because that way every single person who came in because we didn't know who we were going to get paired with and it was a chemistry test so I just started walking up to each person as they walked in and like wrote a couple things about them, wrote their name down. By the end of like everybody arriving, I knew everybody's name, where they were from. Like I wanted to make sure that I could be like, Jason, you know, um, I know that your background, like I really wanted to have that like inside because when you're working with an ensemble, that chemistry is everything. It is. And it can't be like, you can't fake that. So that was what I was thinking. And so when we went in for, you know, the first couple rounds, honestly, I didn't even notice that they were making cuts and stuff. I had no idea until the end of day one, because that's how focused I was on like just making sure that I was like still in the zone. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we went through two days. It was like Survivor. And uh, at the end, I mean, there were, you know, X amount of us standing at the end. And then we got calls like pretty much right away to let us know that we had booked. And that's how it happened. And it just, it happened so fast, but so slowly. Right. Hey, I get that. Want to say hi to Lee. Hey, Lee Walsh. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Erica, so <laughs> I never told you this, but so when they were, so after they cut everyone on the first day, I had left my car keys inside the, no, I left my parking ticket that they had to validate inside the room. As I'm walking in to get my ticket, I hear the producer saying, okay, you guys made the cut. <laughs> And Jeff, Jeff looks at me like, <laughs> I know, it's okay though. I mean, hey. I, you, those, that's one of those moments though, where you're like, okay, what is this moment trying to tell me? Because <laughs> this is just too crazy to like be a coincidence. You know, like, what is this telling me? For I, sure. Uh, and, I, and of course, you know, uh, I, I had a smile like, oh, you know, but I walked out there feeling like that was the most awkward. That's like farting in a room during a test and everyone knowing it's you, but you trying to play it off. Or <laughs> you're taking a nap in class and you fart and it wakes you up. That's what that felt like. Because it was just like, okay, well, clearly that guy didn't get the job, but he's, we know we saw him get cut and then now we're congratulating everyone that got kept. But it's cool though, because you made it on this show and it was, it was just, it was so awesome to see. It was really, I mean, everyone from Tori to Sam, Jeff, um, just, it was, it's just the, you got the perfect chemistry. And of course you guys have had some changes, but the show has evolved and you have evolved with the show as well, because now, we are seeing an Erica, and we've been seeing an Erica who, unapologetic, there are some times where I think you're going to read someone, Erica, and you get that look like, and the one shot is right on you, and you're like, let me just educate the masses here. And it's, but it's, it's, it's so compelling to watch. You, in your evolution on Daily Blast Live, how has that come to be? Because at first, Erica, bubbly. Now you're bubbly, but there's so much more depth there. Well, the show has evolved. You know, when we first started three years ago, um, we weren't really tackling, you know, the deep issues. And, you know, as a result of us being live, we're live four and a half hours a day. We're getting information as it's coming in. So we were live for the copy verdict. We were live for... Um, for multiple shootings, um, multiple mass shootings, where you're like, you don't have time to process, you're processing with everyone else. So much of the information that we get, it's like sometimes we don't have time to process that. And it's just like, what are you gonna do in the moment? And for me, I'm used to, I think it's more natural for me to have a real conversation about some real consequential things than to do the bubbly, you know, light stuff. Because my original morning radio job, you know, we had, we had Obama on, there was a time where we had Obama on like once a week. I mean, at the time he was our Senator 
but he was very accessible. Like we were, we would have these conversations that were, you know, consequential conversations and they were live in real time. And I had two co-hosts who were male about my, around my parents' age. They were older than me. I was only 25 at the time. And I had to hold my own against, you know, people who might have not shared the same ideology or political beliefs or whatever it was. And I couldn't just show up and be like, well, I don't know, you know, like I had to show up and really make sure that I was being represented in a way that people who saw me felt like they were being represented as well. And that was a really hard task to do because I wasn't the most respected person in the room. I didn't have the long resume. I didn't have the street cred. And so fighting against that and, and trying to you know, figure out my way through that was something that took years to do and I don't know if I ever really mastered that there I feel like now I'm in a situation where I can get more experience to master something like that because I'm very confident in uh what I bring to the table and the idea that I'm it's from my point of understanding so if it's from your point of understanding you can't ever really go wrong right well you have shown your part of your point of understanding on many a subject. I mean, we're going to talk about one of the, one of your most pivotal moments on DBL in just a few, but I loved when, I mean, I know it's, it's no secret that you're, that you're a Swifty and, and <laughs> <laughs> it's no secret, but when everything went down last spring with Scooter Braun and Big Machine Records and Scott Prochetta and the legacy of Taylor's music and how you, and how you were able to take that, which you know, working at ET, I covered it as well, but we covered it in a way, hey, Ty hey Tyra, we covered it in a way that was, it's, we're a news, we were a news organization, so we have to report the news, and there wasn't a lot of opinion to be had. But you covered it in a way that gave it, made it compelling, and made it, and you know, you were very passionate about not only it being Taylor Swift, but this woman is being what seemed to be bullied by these men, and how that didn't sit well with you. And so, what are some of the challenges that you have faced on the show and other times where you are so passionate about opinion about about you're so passionate about your opinion excuse me but when you leave you think damn was i did i go too hard was i was i too aggressive did i feel like did i feel like i may have alienated people in the audience tell, tell us about a time that you felt that oh man well first of all um hide any swifties out there what i love about the swifties is I've, I've been made an honorary Swifty uh, because I wouldn't have called myself a Swifty before. I mean, I appreciate anyone who's made success in an industry and I don't see, I know Taylor Swift gets all sorts of flack for, flack for all different reasons. I don't see that when I see Taylor Swift. When I see Taylor Swift, I see a woman who has had similar experiences as I have in my industry or you know in my background so that's the reason why i'm so passionate about what she's talking about in terms of you know owning her own creative or having some guy or anyone come in and say you know what i'm going to make this transaction behind your back although it directly affects you your image or your creative like, I've been on the short end of that stick. So if I ever hear that from anyone, then I'm going to speak out on their, their behalf. Or it's not even necessarily their behalf. It's on behalf of people who can't speak out for themselves, which is what I believe Taylor Swift really is trying to do. Because if you think about it, as successful as Taylor is, and as much money as the woman has made, like, I kind of question if I was in that position, would I just be like, y'all, I'm tired. I'm done speaking. <laughs> like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, would I just be like, okay, throw in the towel. But this is someone who's trying to open up doors and I respect that. <clears throat> so with the Taylor Swift situation or really any time that you're kind of picking a side, you have to do what is going to allow you to sleep at night. And I cannot sleep at night knowing that I had something to say in order to advocate for anyone. And I just chose to stay silent. That is something that like is in direct conflict with my spirit. And to be honest, I don't really 
necessarily remember every single thing that I say on the air. So there are times where I think like, oh, did I, did I say this? Did it come across the right way? Um, but you can't, you just have to put that to bed because we're live. And just like when you communicate interpersonally to anyone else, um, sometimes things don't come out 100% the way that you anticipated them coming out. And that's okay. That's called real. If you want someone who is going to say the perfect thing every single time and the dictation is going to be perfect and every point is going to be made perfectly, there's not going to be any blips in the radar. You're not asking for a real person. You're asking for what everyone has been saying that they don't want. Everyone keeps talking about the real, the authentic, the this, the that. But the moment that somebody, like, you know, you come to me and say, I loved what you said about this topic on this day. And the next day, the same person might come and be like, I can't believe you said this about this topic on this day. I hate you. I unfollowed you. Don't even think about following. You know, it's like, wait a minute. Are we supposed to agree on everything? And why would you want that? I don't want friends who agree with me on every single thing. Like, I don't need someone kissing my butt, and I'm not trying to kiss anybody else's butt. Let's have real conversations. That means differing of opinions. That means respect for one another. What the hell happened to that? Right. Uh, snowflakes. Um. <laughs> I'm not even going to get, you know that's a hot button word. I know, um, but it's the truth. Seriously though, real, because that's what I think is the magic of Daily Blast Live. I mean, there's a lot of new shows, a lot of news magazine shows, and the way, not only the chemistry, but just, I mean, I watch daily, you know. I'm, I'm, I watch morning show, the replay, the second replay, the third replay, can't even count, and access. So I see it all day. And one of the things, hey, Greg, one of the things that, that's really cool about DBL is that you do get the real. I mean, there's been times where it's gotten a little uncomfortable with, with, with exchanges between Al and other and former co-hosts or when Sam is really passionate about something. And Sam's passionate about a lot. And, you know, but that's, that's what people want. It, it's, I, it's needed in television. And you have been able to not only talk about things that are affecting the world via news and pop culture, but, and, and excuse me, I can't even talk. In February of 2020, I think it was 2019, uh, Black History Month, you did something that essentially went viral and people have celebrated and it was something that was not being done on television. And that was, you, you are standing in your natural, you went on live and talked about your natural hair journey. And for the longest time, Erica, I had no idea that you were wearing, you were wearing braids and locks that were not real. And so when you, it was like the best, it was like a RuPaul's Drag Race hair reveal <laughs> on Daily Blast Live. It was like, I'm Erica Cobb and I'm going to lip sync for my life. Oh, here's my, here's my natural hair. But no, on all seriousness. <laughs> and you better not F it up. <laughs> Don't F it up. But that went everywhere. I mean, the views on YouTube, the, the articles, Twitter, people were talking about, wow, not many people were doing that. What, was the, what, what compelled you to have that moment to say, I'm doing this, point blank, period, there you go? I was tired, Jason. <laughs> I was really, really freaking tired. Like, I'm, the most honest thing I can say about where I am right now and, like, starting DBL and and just the choice to really take that risk. Once I made the choice to resign from my job and like really go for this, knowing what the outcome could have been on the negative side, but never really putting much investment in that, then it was kind of like no holds bar. Like it kind of made me a scary person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you scary no. Yeah, well, because it makes you, it, when, when you're like really like, okay, I am going to live my most authentic self, my most authentic truth, that is a scary situation to be in because you don't really know what's going to make you tick or what's going to turn you on until it happens. But the thing about it is no one in the outside knows that either. So 
you have to have a real strong sense of self and other people have, have to have a real strong sense of who you are. Because I had gotten to the point where I had already done the big chop. I had already decided that I wanted to wear my hair natural. And because of the auditions, I was wearing my hair in braids and they wanted to keep that look, which I was like, okay, I'll do the braids. I didn't want to do the hair extension. Um, not because I have some type of thing against hair extensions or anything like that, but I did have a part owner or half ownership in a hair extension company for a few years. And I realized that it wasn't that it was just another look for me. It was something that I was depending on in order to be me. And I can't depend on anyone else's hair, anyone else's anything in order to formulate who I am and it was something that was very deep for me it wasn't about like oh black women shouldn't wear hair extensions or anything like that I think everyone should do what they want to do um it was just about how deep I had gotten into it and the fact that I couldn't let it go so when I chopped my hair and made the decision I was going to wear my hair, hair natural that was it I had made that decision so when I was more in like a role it was so against my spirit at that point. Like I was having this internal conflict and it was making me be a little less me. So when I met Michelle Obama and I had these conversations about where I wanted things to go, I didn't know what the hell was going to happen. I had been wearing a wig for over a year. My hair was in serious disarray. Like I had some major damage on my hair, my edges, like y'all, my edges, did you hear my edges grew back? My edges grew back, y'all. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had to, um, you know, really step into who I am authentically. And it was also a risk because I didn't know how to do my hair. Like when people say natural hair journey, you Google that stuff on YouTube. And these women, God bless them. They look amazing. But like my hair was not doing that. And it did not look like that. And I, and I mine either. To, I'm on my natural hair journey too. Lord, I mean, it's like to be vulnerable. And I just said, I'm going to be vulnerable because I can't think that I'm just going to wake up one day and this is going to be it. Like, I did my natural hair journey live on air. Every single day was like, I don't know what this is going to be. But at the end, like in that year, in February, I just remember thinking like, man, that was the most powerful thing I could have done because I am so disconnected from what the outcome was. Yeah, and it was, I mean, watching it, I just remember, I mean, I saw it live. And so, it was, and, and I was just thinking, I wonder how she's feeling because I remember Sam, I mean, they came back from break and it was this, it was like, it was almost, it was like the Oscars. It was like, and after the break, best actor, you know, you know, you know it was, it was, yeah, it was incredible. And so I was, I was thinking what Erica must be feeling sitting like in that chair right now, because you, you don't know. And it's, and people, the conversation for people of color, especially black, I mean, there's all various people of people of color in the industry. If you are Polynesian, you know what I mean. But when you are African-American and black, you know, you, there is people, even for myself working at my previous job, I always, I always had to keep my hair clean and faded and looking nice because I didn't want, I was afraid that if I wasn't doing that, I would be seen as unkept or scraggly or in, in, all these stupid things that are not true, but we've been conditioned Mm -hmm. to feel that if we don't look a certain way, then you're, you are less than, especially when you are talent and you are being purchased by a buyer to be talent for their outfit, right? So you're always worried about, am I, am I, you don't, you don't give yourself the freedom to just have this, not have a lining. Yeah. You know what I mean? But so when, so I was thinking when you did that, well, she must be feeling like on nervous, excited, relieved, you know? So it's great to hear the, the, the whole situation, how it played out because from there, I mean, just again, the response you have received, even the comments below, people are like, yes, girl, wow. And I just remember, well, I think Sam was emotional. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a very emotional, like, I, it was, 
I can, I, there were so many things that people said to me, you know, people who, you know, are of color, aren't of color, so many things that people said to me in terms of just like owning your authentic self. It wasn't all necessarily about the natural hair journey as it pertained to me. It was about the idea that you've been told for so long that this isn't acceptable, um, that this isn't professional and it's, it, you know, it's not respected. And you just make a decision like, no, it's going to stop now. Because I don't know if I would have been able to carry on on the show um, because we got so real and raw about so many things and I started to feel like a fraud and I knew I didn't come in as a fraud. I knew that when we were having conversations about, you know, Beyonce on the cover of, I think, what Vogue or something, Whoa. and she had her hair out. And when we were having these conversations, I felt like I was getting smaller. Like, I felt like I was shrinking. Like, how dare I say anything about this when I feel like I'm hiding right now? And again, this is not about a hair hierarchy. This is specifically about me. And I just didn't want to do the show that way because I had done all the shows my entire career that way. And I thought that this was the chance to do something different and really connect with people. And the crazy thing about it was one of the things that I was so concerned about was the feedback, not just from people who weren't of color, but I was also like, what are black women going to say? Because... <laughs> You know, you. I'm also like, I want to represent well. And I wasn't sure if like, you know, I was going to be able to figure this out. And it took a long time to figure it out. But people were super compassionate. People were like giving me suggestions, which I took so many of those suggestions. Um, you know, there were so many people that were like, sis, let me help. You know, and not, not coming from like a sis, let me help. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was real. But the crazy thing is when I look back on the numbers, on things that like digital numbers in terms of like going viral, everything exploded from there because I felt like I had been unshackled in a way. And I was like, well, this is it. Like, this is the truth. I'm going to give my truth and I'm going to live my truth. I, I would agree that everything really did take off because I mean, like your socials grew. I mean, just just the engagement. I, cause, I mean, I follow you, so the engagement. I, and social media is like one of those things. It's like the wind blows. Some days you have good days, some days you have bad days. But it was just nice to see consistency how your socials are growing and people were engaging with you and they were they were seeing themselves in you. And I and it, I think I think it's it's cool that you highlighted that you wanted to represent well for people of color and you were afraid of what other people of color are going to say because I think now more than ever everyone's watching everything like people are watching now judging you know people, they always have something to say and you having the awareness not that not that you were trying to live because this whole this whole emergence that you had was about you being authentic and being true to who you are so but the fact that you're like yes I can do that but also we know that there is there is a set of people and there's a there's there is a group of people who are waiting for you Kanye West. People are waiting for Kanye West to go and do something stupid. Instead of celebrating his Sunday services, like, oh wait, when is he going to show up at TMZ and act a fool again? Instead of instead of seeing what he's doing that's positive, they're looking for the negative to highlight that versus saying, wow, here's Erica Cobb doing what we're all trying to do, or what some or what is the new. I don't say the new trendy thing to be, but authenticity for a while there's everyone's like, I want your authentic self. I want to be who I am, no Alicia Keys, no makeup, all these really cool initiatives. And you're, and you're authentically just being who you are, not to get praise, not to get, not to be the new, the new girl that's like, I'm repping for all black women. No, you're saying, listen, I'm trying to be unshackled, as you said. So for you to be like, yeah. well, I want to I do this right and not, and, and make sure that I'm just being a positive example for people who see us and don't see anything positive at all. You know? Right, right. Right. And that, I mean, that's what you said about the, you know, the polished look, like that's how we get cred, right? Like we don't have, you know, people, a lot of people of color, minority groups, we don't have a, the luxury of being able to kind of like mail it in at any point. 
Like it has to be on a 10 to 15 to 20 at all times. Uh, pause for a second. I just have to say hi to Uncle Al. Um, Uncle Al was my Uber driver in Sacramento, but he turned into my uncle. Uh, <laughs> he picked me up every morning at 4.30 to go to work. So hi to Papa King. Hey, Al. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you don't, you know, you have to be, you have to be 100% all the time. But what I think really happened when I made the decision to just be like, okay, this is going to be my authentic self and we're going to figure this out in real time. It also forced me in a way to not lean on, like I had to turn off all of this. And on television, that's hard to do because you're constantly well like this, this is what it's a visual medium this right right is what we're getting so i trusted you know we fortunately have a team but they were also like we got to figure this out like no one knew how to do my hair including me <laughs> so we were all trying to figure this out so i just said i'm going to put this in your hands because I'm gonna concentrate on what I'm saying. And because I was concentrating on the content, even when I was like, oh God, that wasn't my best day. It wasn't the best representation. No one really said anything about what I looked like. Everybody was talking about what I was talking about. And as a woman, especially as a black woman, does it get any better than that? The right. content of what you're saying, the content of your character, and not based on like what you just look like that day. That's the blessing of the team that's there at DBL. When I went to visit last uh, September, it was just so refreshing because there's some outlets that don't have that type of um, great, good energy um, that they that they care, you know, and that they're that's a, that it's a team and, and they're there. Talent, the word talent. So for those that are watching, talent are people who do jobs in entertainment, right? Singers, dancers, hosts, whatever, radio jockey, they're considered talent. And when you're a talent, you have people who, who take care of those things. They have jobs that help talent be their best selves to do the job they're hired to do. But it's nice that people also get it and they really support that because you can work in places where you're talent and you're so treated like you're you're, you know, I don't know, not, not, you're, you're nothing. So I love that about DBL. And I'm glad you, you are, I've been able to have that experience there because there's a lot of places here in LA that don't provide that mm -hmm. and don't get it. And DBL gets it. And, and you can see, and since you've had that, that, I don't want to say emergence, cause, but since you, not even an evolution, since you be, you've, you've become the Erica Covenant you are now, it definitely shows daily and your opinions and what you're talking about and your place. It's interesting because there's eight people on that show, eight. But there, everyone's so buoyant. Everyone, there's equal. No one, like, no one, it doesn't feel like one person's left out. You don't see someone, every, everyone's opinion matters from Brandon, to Stephanie, from Tori. I love when you, Lindsay and Tori are on the show together because you guys, you're so similar in the energy you have, but you're so, you're so dissimilar in your opinions and it just works and it's a joy to watch. And then when you're cutting up with Brandon, when you're shady Brandon, it's, 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 but it's, it's fun. It's like this brother sister situation that just works for television. I think that's why DBL has been so successful, but you've been successful outside of DBL. What's this I'm seeing you with TI now? Oh man, yeah. Um, so I did uh, expeditiously Ti's uh, podcast, and um, he had me be a guest co-host, which was just, I mean, really awesome because especially the content of what we were talking about. We were talking about COVID in the African American community, the messaging um, of how we're communicating, the idea of not getting the message lost in the messenger. I mean, it was a very, uh, very well-rounded conversation. And I thought he and I having that conversation really brought out a lot of different topics and different um, points of view because, you know, it's like one thing I did say during the podcast is that we always talk about the Black community as if it's this homogenized group we can like GPS our way to. 
And we have to talk about the complexities and the diversity within the communities. Otherwise, we're always going to be looking for one singular messenger in order to talk to the Black community. How is one person supposed to talk to any community, especially when you're talking about a group of people that are part of a massive culture? I mean, it really is kind of taking away some of the, or many of the things that make Black people great. Like, when we just decide that we're going to just, you know, lump everything, you know, everyone into one group. So having that conversation with him was a really great opportunity. And I'm just so, you know, so glad that they originally reached out to me about the, um, the Kobe clip. And I didn't know if it was the right time because that people have to understand when a lot of these things happen, um, especially a viral moment, it's not planned. Like, if you get home, like, it's crazy. Like, so that happened on a Friday. I got home and um, my phone just started, burr, 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 you know, like, it's going off, going off, going off. And honestly, I mean, 100% that it starts an anxiety attack for me because I don't know if it's good, bad, indifferent, what the topic is. What did I say? Right. Who reposted it. Like, it's just a blah, 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 blah. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh gosh, because I didn't want, I felt like it was too soon to be talking about him in that way at all. But because it was, it, he hadn't even been buried yet. It was a very sensitive, sensitive situation. So when it became like the topic everyone was talking about, and I just, I remember, I think Sam asked me a question and I just started talking and it just turned into this whole other thing because it got like, I'm always talking to one person and then I got really emotional about it because I was thinking of my younger brother, Aaron, and how he was, you know, accused, not in that way. I mean, it wasn't that the severity of, you know, that accusation, but like how he was accused of something and everyone just believed it because he was a young uh, teenage black boy and this girl wasn't a person of color. And just how defeated, like how hurt he was. And it wasn't anything sexual, it wasn't anything like that. It was just the idea that like, you can be in a situation where it's one person's word against another person's word. And you're like, it, it, you've already lost before you've opened your mouth. And it's interesting to see, you know, the evolution of who he is and the evolution of who she is, because I could have called that 15, 20 years ago, but nobody else saw that. So when I'm having that conversation, I was thinking about that. And I was like angry and it was frustrating and it was hurtful. And, you know, you just kind of go with your gut of how that conversation is going to go. And that's what happened. So when that was a, an opportunity to talk more about that, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that I, um, out of respect for Kobe and his legacy. Um, and now that we're having other conversations, um, you know, it's a little different, but it was just a little too soon. Yeah. But I'm glad that I waited because um, having that conversation last week, we recorded it almost two weeks ago. Um, was a more well-rounded, dynamic conversation about things that were happening in real time. And I felt like it gave me a purpose to continue this conversation and make sure that the Black community is getting the message about what's happening. With well, <clears throat> I mean, it leans back on to, to how you're able to connect with people, Erica, and how you're able to... I'm, like, I'm not trying to gaslight you. You know I love you, girl. But I mean, from, from a professional situation, from a professional from one from one media person host, why can't I talk from one host and one journalist to another? Um, you know, I think that the work you've done, people are taking notice. And when you when you're standing in your truth and you're living your you're living your authentic self, and you're just doing what feels right without without malice and with intention, things like that happen. People give you platforms to talk about things that are important. I'm glad that Ti has to reach out to you and want to continue that conversation because for a lot of people, a lot of people were conflicted about Kobe, really. 
I've heard conversations about Kobe that have been like, whoa, you really? Like, seriously. And then the same thing with Gail. A lot of people, the whole, just everything, the whole, the Kobe Bryant, the Kobe Bryant experience of 2020 was, was just a lot for a lot of people, especially being here in Los Angeles too, yeah. you know? So for you to, 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 be able to be able to continue that conversation is a wonderful thing. And like the comeback with Eric Cobb, we need more things like that because people want people we're, i think now more than ever especially now that we're in quarantine and we're now with covid and how we're we're, we're gonna come we're not going to emerge from this the same you know i think people are still struggling to survive i mean even though they're in their homes even though they're 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 self-isolating they're trying to stay away from something that's out there that we can't see that has what close to one million cases in the united states alone sixty thousand people almost sixty thousand people have died we're afraid and people are spending more time with them, more time with themselves and doing just that, spending time with themselves and really thinking about who they are, lessons that they've learned, places that they haven't been, things they wanted to accomplish, regrets they may have. So people are trying to have their own comebacks. They're trying to come out of this as someone new. So when you have a space like the comeback with Erica Cobb, I think people want that. We want to feel good again. We want to feel good. You know what feels good, Erica? You know what feels really good? Binge watching. TV. I know you're doing a lot of that these days. What are you watching? Oh, man. I have been, yeah, 20s on BET. Lena, Wait oh, my Lanta. That show is so good. Too short. Too short. Like, but, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not done with it. Oh, that's right. They're still releasing. I've watched so many, I've watched so many shows that they've been like out for a while that when I get to like the eighth episode, I'm like, oh, the season's over. <laughs> like, well, it's, it's terrible. They do only eight episodes. Like, why don't you give, give me a full 24? What happens to the whole it, season order? Is it only eight then? I, I haven't seen it. I, I haven't seen it. But like making the cut on Amazon, which you should watch, is really good. It was only 10 episodes. It's like, mm, could we get 15? Just 15. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to check it out. Yeah, I love 20s. Um, I just finished uh, Black AF. Bomb. Okay. It, it's, it's good, but I, look, it's, you have to... It's, a, it's the most. It's a lot of things. It's, it's, I mean, it, it, Kenya Barris is fantastic. Rashida Jones, I don't know. Not, I'm, not, I, I just, I'm not buying it, but it's, but it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> no shade, y'all. No shade. <laughs> But it's just like, what am I watching? And is why is it okay that every streaming platform show says the F word? Like, it's just like, F this, F that, F this, F that. Like, F the, the F word is, is like saying the. I know, I know. So, uh, Black AF, I actually just did a podcast with Justin Claiborne, who's, he plays Pops, and he's so cute. Um, but I, I just did like a little podcast with him. Justin's like 13 years old. So he's just such a cutie. Anywho, um, so I watched the whole show before I, I talked to him. And I was really kind of confused because there was a lot of controversy about Black AF and people talking about colorism and uh, socioeconomic class and Blacks and blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. And I was like, man... I kind of feel like this is the diversity that the black community needs. Yeah. <laughs> because honestly, I, I do I really, I really believe that. Not because it's like, oh, this family represents whatever, but this family represents something we haven't seen before and something that is clearly out there. And I think it's important we see it. We have to be so buttoned up. Everything has to be like slick. It has to be perfect. Why? Why? And there are some families who operate more like that. And granted, that's not, it's a depiction of his family. It's a more like amplified version of his family. But I want to see that too. I want to see a Black Larry David. Erica. I want to see it. Look, we're, me and you are going to continue this conversation off because Instagram's kicking me off in 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> but I feel you. I feel you. I feel you on Black Air. We're going to talk about that. But listen, the comeback with Erica Cobb, DBL, Monday through Friday, where can they find you on social media? 
Erica Cobb, at Erica Cobb. All right. And um, it's been a pleasure connecting with you digitally. <laughs> yes. So great to see you always. Love you, boo-boo. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for coming on, Jason Leach. I'm going to hit you up on the, on the, in the, in the text in a few before Instagram, but I want to get a clean goodbye before they say you got we're gonna, It's right. like the Oscars. They're playing the music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Bye, Eric. I'll see you soon. Bye.